Hello, my name is John Brink and we are on the Brink, uh, our podcast from Prince George. For all those guests that we have from all around the world, uh, you know, the Prince George is 800 kilometers north of Vancouver, British Columbia and Canada, and it is absolutely the most beautiful place on earth, in my opinion. All around us is nature. We have probably within 50 miles or 50, 800 kilometers or 80 kilometers, we have probably a thousand lakes. It is just unbelievable. Today's guest, a special guest, Nadia, Nadia Mansour. Yep. Welcome to the show, Nadia. Thank you, John, for having me today. So, We've talked a little bit uh, together in, over the past number of months. Uh, you know, tell me a little bit more about uh, your past. Were you, are you from BC originally or about your background? Mm -hmm. um, I always think it's funny because I was born in Quenelle. So uh, it's a small town um, and usually somebody who I would say visually is culturally diverse. People are always like, oh, Quenelle, that's kind of cool. Yeah. And then, of course, you get the question, like, where are you from originally? Yeah, and yeah. people are curious. From um, where? Like, where are you from originally? And I yeah. always, and people are curious. And um, I'm from Syria, so both my parents are Syrian. So I'm, I'm originally from Syria. Um, and my parents um, were, went from Syria, and they were in the States for a little bit. My older sister was born there. Um, and then they moved to Canada. My dad got work here, um, and uh, yeah, I was born here. <laughs> so you, you you were born in, and again for our guest, uh, you know, uh, Quanell is about 100 kilometers south of Prince George. Uh, beautiful small community. We are 10, 10 12,000 people, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, area and a beautiful region. Now, you, your parents came originally from Syria. And uh, when did they, and you were born in Canada or were you born in Syria? In Canada. And, and your older sister was born in Syria? No, she was born in Chicago. So in Chicago? Got, yeah. Oh my goodness. Eh? Now, uh, you know, the, you, both your parents, correct me if I'm wrong, are physicians? My father is, my mother's not, but yeah, my dad's a, a cardiologist. Cardiologist. Yeah. And, and he worked in, in Quanell at the hospital there before you came to Prince George yeah, yeah. and then uh, how long have they been or you and your family been in Prince George ever since I was about three or so when I moved here and now I'm about to turn 20 in a few months so roughly 16 17 years being yeah. in Prince George so, so and I'm always very careful to talk about ages but you already <laughs> gave it away you six you were 16 then and now you're 19 and uh, I'm allowed to say that right so yeah, yeah. and uh, you know the uh, so the the other thing uh, is so interesting about you you already have quite a background in a career you are studying at the University of Northern British Columbia um, are you taking commerce or marketing or mm -hmm. a combination of all the above I'm I'm in commerce and specifically I'm taking a marketing degree at the yeah. UMBC yeah so, and then the other thing that I find interesting about you, you're a host on a, on a radio show or a television show. Yeah, <laughs> a few <laughs> different hats, but up at the university, um, I got my start into journalism, which is yeah. a whole nother side of my passions that I love to do um, through the radio there. It's called Seifer. Um, and I have a little radio show called The Northern Exchange. Um, but that segued into giving me, you know, skills within journalism and interviewing and audio and all the great stuff. And, um, gratefully I was, um, Catherine Hansen from CBC reached out to me and yeah, I've gotten now to work with CBC since January of this year. So, oh, wow. um, and that's been probably one of the most rewarding things I've done. So, so what exactly great. do you do at CBC? Well, here in Prince George, we um, only have a radio bureau. So it's yeah. mostly, there's a host, Carolina, the show. Yeah, yeah. Very um, popular, by the way. Yeah. You know, because people from all over Northern BC listen to it, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. It's called Daybreak North. That's the show, right? Yeah, yeah. So 
it was kind of funny because growing up, I would oh be in the car and my dad would drop us off at school, yeah. and I would hear these, all these names: Andrew Curiata, yeah, Betsy yeah. Trumpener, and Carolina Derike, and um, it was so surreal to work in a newsroom with yeah. the people I grew up listening to. So a day to day kind of um, will you get everybody pitches things in the morning, which yeah. I always say is like marketing. You have to pitch an idea, a story. Um, something that you think is compelling and yeah. a story that you not only think needs to be told, but there is an importance behind it. Like that's the biggest thing. It's an important story. Exactly. And um, from there, um, the producer on that day will decide what stories are actually going to be pursued. Yeah. And then you have the day to chase and contact people, yeah. book an interview. It depends on what you're doing. Sometimes for radio, you'll hear just a live interview, right? Yeah, yeah. Or you might hear like a mix, which is like um, something that's been pre-prepared. So it's like a mix of voices, sound, music, whatever um, the piece is about. Uh, and yeah, then you got to submit by deadline. And <laughs> that's kind of it. So, so you've been working with them since January. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the, the, the CBC uh, Daybreak, very, very popular. I have had the privilege of being on it yeah. a number of times. Sometimes it was live, other times it was recorded, but uh, it's listened to widely. In some cases, even down the coast, are picking mm -hmm. up some of the stories that exactly. are produced here. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is quite, uh, quite a compliment to uh, Northern BC and CBC in particular. Mm -hmm. You know, so so. How long have you been, uh, now you're on your studies, you're starting up again, I presume, in September. Mm -hmm. And uh, so how many years do you have to be at uh, UNBC before you get your degree uh, in, uh, in commerce? Right. So I'm currently going into my third year of university. Third, third year. So yeah. is it four years then? Uh? Yeah. It's about four years. So I have two years left. Hopefully we'll get through it and grind it out. It is definitely a challenge balancing, you know, a career that you love, right? And journalism is very fast paced. It's very demanding um, in a sense where like, you can't really take a day off. You have to be constantly absorbing, observing and just questioning, right? Yeah. Like in your daily life, um, along with <laughs> being a student and along with, you know, all the other responsibilities that life kind of has for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's interesting that I think about it, though, is that I think, like, I wouldn't really have it any other way. I think that a lot of times it's, like, in pursuit of, like, what you want, you know that you're, there's things that are you're going to have to let go of, right? Yeah. Whether it's, you know, that extra, you know, hang out with somebody or, yeah. you know, how you spend your time, you know, watching a show or something like a yeah, Netflix yeah. show, something as simple as that. Sometimes you know that those are things that have to give Yeah. if there's something else that you really, really want. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and so, the, you know, so when I see kind of looking at some of your background, I, but I see a strong tendency towards marketing. You're obviously a very good communicator already. That's obvious, and uh, uh, you know the. So where do you see your career going, and what direction? The other one is uh, some people come out of commerce uh, are going to, uh, you know, we hired a number of people in our operation that have a background at UBC, in particular in commerce, and then one beyond that. Uh, one of the fellows that works closely with us is uh, Sonny Coulard that uh, got his uh, training there and then went on to be uh, uh, in, in the accounting out financial field, the CPA and CA from there. And then the other one is Scott McWalter that you have met here and there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has his background as an MBA as well. And, uh, you know, and, and, and kind of found his direction into marketing and communications. How about you? Where, where, where do you see yourself go? I have two answers for that. Okay. First of all, I think I've heard this before where sometimes we're asked a question like, where do you see yourself in five years or yeah. 10 years from yeah, now? Yeah. Yeah. And I think really it's hard to answer that question sometimes because really what we think or where we think we'll be in a certain number of years is always much smaller than where we actually end up. Okay. 
And I feel like that's really, as a person of faith, it's just, it's God, really. Because God's planning in our lives is supersedes any kind of thing that we have for ourselves or any kind of notion of, oh, I think I can achieve this goal and this goal and this goal. And God's like, actually, you're going to be here, right? And so it's like, God really, um, I think, is that like extra guide in my life. And I think he, he really is what, um, I think, drives me. I think people are like, oh, you're so driven, Natty. And I think it's just because um, I feel like I live excited to see God's plan more than my own. Okay. So I think that's like the first part of it. But of course, <laughs> there's goals that you do have in mind and that you are, you know, hopefully trying to achieve. I definitely love the space of journalism. It's given me the ability to meet yeah. so many incredible people. Um, so I do still see that dream coming alive, um, just to continue working um, within CBC or other you know news organizations within Canada to keep telling stories that I th feel like you know need to be told. The flip side of that is that I am a marketing guru <laughs> and I love marketing. Yeah. And I think that um, I mean Scott and I were chatting right before this. I mean, where is marketing going to be? in 10 years from now? How are you actually going to be able to reach people? I think it's really interesting for me to think about these things because... Social media? Yeah, and I feel like even social media itself, like creators or if you've ever tried to market through social media, sometimes you find that you're already hitting walls with that, you know, in terms of like engagement and what's truly getting viewership and what's getting likes and what's, what's actually like cr generating... Um, not just people to view your content, but for somebody to actually click a link further yeah. into what you do, right? Yeah. So I think my I think the marketing side of me is like hoping to kind of get more into that space and yeah. and find creative ways to figure out what marketing is going to look like in the How future. How about writing? Are you involved in writing? I see that again as uh, something that uh, obviously I have been quite involved in that in my two books mm -hmm. and uh, that another form of communication amazingly because we were so involved in printing books and doing all these yeah. other kind of things that during the COVID period writers have become very very active and even the ones that were not accepted as writers have started writing books and what we have found is uh, with the people that do the printing of books and the marketing side of it all are buried in uh, books that need to be printed in fact our book that came out against all odds uh, the one and then uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, the, uh, the new one that we did uh, ADHD. ADHD unlocked uh, we, we had to be just at the right time to get it to our printers as what they call print ready. If it would have been a week late or a delay, it would have meant a year before they could print it. Wow. So that has been one of the things. And, uh, you know, so, so, so what I see, and, uh, and, and you may as well, is that uh, the whole issue of marketing, social media, communications in different forms has changed and is much more active now than it used to be in the past and likely will continue to do that. Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, like he was sitting podcasting in Prince George, uh, downtown Prince George, and, uh, you know, that we already know from our past that probably between 30 and 40,000 people are going to watch this podcast. And, and a lot of them are from not necessarily the region but even from around the world that are watching podcasts that they find interesting for whatever reason mm. uh, just today I, two days ago i think i did a podcast uh, you know with uh, an individual in germany uh, you know the uh, and the, the the viewers that that person had on his exceeded between one and two million viewers. Amazing. Yeah. You know, so all of that is starting to change and, uh, you know, saying that how then can you be more active in it, you meaning in a general sense, uh, even for myself, uh, 
uh, I'm going to turn 82 in about two months, you know, so that, uh, you know, but I'm still doing TikTok and I'm still doing, uh, with the help of some of my people, I must admit, but I'm still very active on Facebook, very active on Instagram and, and all of the other media, in including writing. Uh, I'm writing another book that's coming out next July. Uh, and and but I, my goal is to write one book every year as long as I'm able. And, uh, you know, so uh, all of that is the process of writing, uh, you know, new books and communicating. The other one, uh, you know, it's close to my heart is that uh, I always had difficulty because I didn't have the self-confidence. It's all in my books, actually, uh, you know, to be a public speaker, uh, you know, then uh, by pure coincidence, I. And, the, and somebody brought me physically down to Toastmasters, which focused in communication, yeah. and uh, you know, and, and I was at fear of it. You know, initially I said, uh, uh, you know, my ex sister in law brought me down there and said, uh, I said, I'm not going as long as I know that nobody is going to ask me any questions. And then when I was sitting there, very friendly environment. He asked me at some point, he said, uh, hey, John, uh, can you tell us a little bit about you? And I said, oh, my God. And then the next time, I was not going to go. But I then did go. And, and, and the rest of the story, I stayed there for 10 years, became likely one of the most active speakers in the province and beyond, and it changed my life. It cost me $2 a, day, uh, a week. You know, uh, you know, so the point that I'm making is becoming effective communications communicators through either podcast, writing, or in all forms, I believe, are, offer great opportunities in your journalism and uh, in, in all those areas. Mm -hmm. oh, well, certainly, I mean, just being able to communicate with people is so crucial. I mean, especially not just in, you know, the journalism world, but in business in general. I mean, it's, you know, one of the biggest avenues to reach people, which you have done yourself, is to be the face of your company or to be the face of your brand because it helps create a strong human connection to why they're supporting a certain person or a certain brand. I mean, we're human by nature, right? So we're going to, we're more uh, likely to adhere to a brand or a company when we associate, you know, a positive image or a positive person, right? So um, being able to do that, which I feel like you've, you've set a wonderful example um, in Prince George and in Northern BC as to what that really looks like, right? And it's being out in the community, it's engaging with people, and it's not just about, you know, necessarily like just talking to people it's about listening to people too and i think that um you've done that so <laughs> thank you for being that in our community um i always see you out and uh you know i follow you on facebook and stuff so um lots of john brink <laughs> in my feed <laughs> well thank you very much you see i i, I want to mention this when you say that because it's so important what you say is that become good communicators and, and, and coming back to Toastmasters because I'm a huge fan of Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. I, was the, the, I was the absolute worst example of somebody that needed help desperately because I had so much difficulty communicating or lack of self-confidence and, and it changed my world and uh, you know and already at a fairly advanced age, age actually because I, by the time I joined Toastmasters I was around 50 some odd years old. And, uh, but what I always say about Toastmasters, to understand, a lot of people think that it is all about speaking or making presentations. It is, but it isn't. It makes, you, the most important thing in communications are to be a good listener. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, those kind of things are important. You know? Yeah, I think we forget how important it is to take a step back and, and listen because, um, if we don't do that, then the communication that we're giving out or we're offering is always going to lack true voice, right? When you take a step back and you listen, um, and not even just listening to the voices you want to hear, you have to hear everything, right? And that's very important, let's say, in journalism, right? When you 
when you're telling a story, you have to make sure that you've heard every single side, that you know that you're incorporating everyone. Like, a, in our whole space after Corona and we saw the Freedom Convoy and these issues kind of arise where the media was extremely scrutinized, especially, let's say, CBC. Um, these m big corporations, media outlets in Canada, worldwide, really anyone, were kind of put under this like scrutiny where it's like fake news and the media is virus, all the good stuff. And I think that when you see stuff like that, it was a tough time to be a journalist. Yeah. It was a very tough time to be a journalist. Yeah. And I remember feeling a feeling that people forget that it's just people. <laughs> We're just people telling stories. And in that space, as a journalist, when you're telling a story, it's never, you can never tell a story with um, your own opinion. I think people forget that, like the, the stories we publish, really we try our best to avoid bias and our own, like our own thoughts or opinions about subjects. And really, um, we're just trying to tell what's going on. Of course, there are lots of instances where that doesn't actually happen and we don't achieve that to a complete extent. But I think people forget that like, it's not our job to convey um, one side or the other, we're just conveying what's going on. Right. And sometimes what's going on isn't always what people want to hear. So it makes it tough. But um, it's important still to listen, even in times where um, you personally disagree. There's a lot of times where you follow stories and you see something or you have to report on something where you're like, ah, but then you have to remove that bias constantly from things and really listen um, in order to uh, really tell the story. Because if you're blocked by some kind of bias or some kind of perception and you're ignorant to remove that, right? Or you're ignorant to come into a space and acknowledge that like this other person has lived every single day apart from whatever your life has looked like. Right. And you have to really, really uh, acknowledge that. And I think the other half of it is just like when you're telling stories of people um, and you really want to listen, I think you have to be uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think um, that's kind of what's made me a better journalist is that sometimes you're going to be very uncomfortable in what you're doing in the sense of like you're going to have to take a risk or you're going to have to talk to somebody I mean I've been in journalism or dabbling in it for now almost two years coming up in a few months so it's like originally it would be like I would only talk to younger people like my age people right like that's just a very basic example because it felt scary or uncomfortable or you know, there's like something within you that's kind of like holding you back. Like, I can't talk to, you know, somebody who's 30. They're too old. Not that 30 year olds are old, but you get what I'm saying. Like, in my sphere as a, as a, somebody who's becoming an adolescent, I guess, it feels scary. But then you kind of sit with that, like, feeling uncomfortable or feeling like you're not sure if you want to take this, that risk. And then you do. And then you realize it's really not so bad. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So it, you grow and you have to sit with that a little bit. Yeah. And we all go through that, Nadia, you yeah. know, so that uh, at different levels, I certainly did, uh, you know, as I said earlier to you, it's kind of Toastmasters pulled me out mm -hmm. of that in a way because I felt, uh, uh, you know, uncomfortable, uh, didn't have the self-confidence that I required. So all of that is so important, uh, you know, that... Uh, uh, you know, and then the other part uh, in the next book that I'm doing right now is uh, comes out next July. Is uh, we did against all odds that was more about a biography, uh, not not about. Uh, I don't know if you've seen a copy of it or did you mm -hmm. read part of it. I've seen it. It's been all up at the university too. I've seen it when I buy my textbooks. It's just drawn. <laughs> I'm gonna get. Uh, did you get a signed copy? I have one of your ADHD book, but not the first um, copy, not against yeah. all odds. Yeah, I'm going to get you one anyway. You know, so the, you know, the, so the, against all odds, the reason that I wrote that, uh, you know, I, I, I always say I thought about it for, I lived, it took me 80 years to live it, then 20 years to think about it, two years to write it. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's not about hurrah, hurrah, John, how successful is John? It's not about that. 
It is about that all these struggles that we as individuals go through, the difficult periods that we go through, if we stay the course and we believe that things will become better and uh, mm -hmm. you know that as long as you never give up and uh, you know and that's what it is all about and then once you uh, you know fail or maybe it appears like you failed like uh, uh, I've talked about it many many times I failed grade three uh, nobody fails grade three that I know anyway and then I failed grade seven three times and uh, uh, you know and, and felt that I was a failure and uh, and I had to start over new again I came to Canada a because we were liberated by the Canadians and I I always even from the time I was five years old I said I want to go to the land of my heroes and I did and uh, my second dream was to I grew up in a lumber my dad was managing a small lumber company my grandfather was a master carpenter and I want to be in the lumber I loved lumber and so I came here and uh, you know, with with minimum amount of money, and then uh, with the dream of building a lumber mill, and uh, so when I came off the bus, I had twenty five dollars forty seven cents. Couldn't speak the language, didn't know a soul, and uh, and uh, you know, and didn't have a job, and uh, you know, but I believed in uh, you know that uh, if you stay the course and uh, you know you stay with it, that things will happen and you will succeed but never give up right so and and then coming out of the environment of the war years obviously I uh, still was affected by PSTD seeing too many things that I should not have seen as many young people do or older people do as well in a war zone during the mm -hmm. second world war and then uh, you know and then the uh, lack of confidence because I felt uh, you know I uh, had failed on, on education and all those things and uh, much much later that by pure coincidence I found out that I had ADHD didn't even know what it was you know I knew now obviously <laughs> and uh, you know and and uh, so that's what uh, against all odds was all about in my opinion is that stay the course you never give up and then uh, even uh, you know, sometimes falling down and, and dusting yourself mm -hmm. up and going back at it again makes you stronger. And, uh, you know, and I did that. But then there was always this other thing. Uh, you know, I had the opportunity to, uh, about three, four years ago now, three years ago, I guess, that uh, I had the honor of receiving the honorary doctorate's award from uh, UNBC in laws. And uh, I had the opportunity to do a presentation and, uh, you know, and that allowed me to kind of speak about things like ADHD and, uh, uh, you know, and, and all those things relating to it, you know, so, uh, and then more after that than any time other than that, uh, I always felt ADHD, it was still had a lot of stigma attached to it. I felt I had to talk about it more and then write about it, hence the book now and, uh, has has already been quite successful mm -hmm. and uh, you know so uh, and uh, not only here but uh, also in other places you know mm -hmm. I think it's so important to talk about it, you know? yeah I mean talking about working hard when at your book launch I was talking to Tracy and we were talking about something that's been ongoing in this sphere which is a shortage of doctors it's been a big deal in BC in Canada it's a hot topic um, and just one segment of that that sh we were discussing was like in order to replace doctors that are currently aging out you don't just need one doctor you need two because of the scope of like that l life where people don't honestly in, in my honest opinion I feel like people don't always work as hard generally as yeah. we used to right I mean I was only in high school a few years ago now, and yeah, people growing up now are like, oh, plan B is TikTok star. Of course, not to diminish anybody's dreams, I think that when you grow up and you dream of being a journalist and you dream of having this career, you, you have these dreams, like not everybody will get through to those dreams. A lot of people are, say that they're going to do things, but it's very, very minimal people who actually end up doing those things, right? And so I think we're in this like sphere where it's like, are people really working as hard as they can? 
or as hard as they used to? And, are, and what is that like grind mentality? What does it really, really take to live out a dream? And I think so often we're stuck in this age where it's like so easy to waste time. So easy. You're just on your phone. And I can't even tell you countless amount of times people have been like, oh, I was just on TikTok for like five hours. That's five hours. So many things can happen in five hours. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, I do see it as a young person where I've always felt like, yeah, I mean, you do feel put down sometimes being somebody with a, like, who I truly believe you have a high grind mentality where you're like always in pursuit of something. Um, and you are willing to sacrifice to get there. And then when other people kind of negate that, and I'm sure you've definitely felt that way. Yeah. Um, it's challenging because you know that you're doing what you're doing and you have a purpose behind it, but then other people will always bring that down, even though like truly, I feel like that's what we are all trying to be. We're all trying to be better or work harder. And, and I feel like the biggest thing really is I think we've forgotten how important it is to fail. Like, I feel like that's the biggest thing is like, I see so many people who are like, Oh, I wish I could be this. And I wish it could be that. And then the unfortunate part is when instead of looking at something or aspiring to something, you let it eat you up into jealousy. Yeah. Right. And then that's when you get gossip and that's when you get, you know, back talk and all that yeah. cr crummy stuff. Right. Yeah. But I always grew up looking at people and being like, that's so amazing. Like, can I do that? Like I would see other Muslim women lift and right. I mean, as first of all, a woman in a gym space and also a Muslim woman, it was kind of like, Oh, I don't really know if I belong there. But then you see other people and you on social media, which there are good parts of it and you get inspired. And I was always, I feel like that being inspired by other people and seeing other people fulfill their dreams within, I guess you could say what God has given them or God's given those people, those certain skills that have helped them get to that point. Really, it's like, okay, well, what do I have? What are the skills that God was like, hey, Nadia, this is how I designed you and really, really, really taking advantage of those and using them to the best of your ability to like super, supersede or get to where you need to be. And the other half of it is when people do bring you down or say these things or try to deviate you from your path that you're trying to, so hard to stay on, I think that you reach a point where not that it doesn't matter because I think like in some way we can't always drown out every single voice, but I think you get to a point where you're working so hard that you just have to know for yourself that you are, that you're the one who's waking up early. You're the one who's exhausted. You're the one who's running off of three hours of sleep on a day. You're the one who's, you know, just barely, you know, making it to the gym at the end of the day at 9 PM and you're just trying to get a workout in go home and eat, and, you know, and you know that for yourself because you feel those emotions, you know how hard you've been working. Um, but in that pursuit of working so hard, you have to be okay to fail. And I think that like, I, that's a lesson I learned very early is that actually failing is a step forward. And I think, I think that's really what's so powerful because there's not a lot of, you know, 19 year olds that you're going to talk to that are going to be like, well, you know, I'm a journalist and I'm studying and I'm doing this. And I think it's because I was so okay failing. Like I was so okay trying everything and being like, all oh, right, this isn't, I guess this didn't work out for me. That's okay. And being like excited by it. Like every time something doesn't work out, I'm like, okay, but something will. And I think that like you get driven by that, like, um, that feeling when things finally work out and you're like, there we go, that's it. And I always use this analogy with people, which is that like, oftentimes a lot of people are, um, like we're running in life, right? And a lot of people, there's two paths really. A lot of people will run and run and run. And as soon as you give, the, as soon as you quench your thirst, right? You're so thirsty, you've been running for however long. And as soon as you've had your water, you're fine, right? You feel okay. Um, and a lot of people will get to that point 
where they've been thirsty for a really long time and they finally have that seed of success or whatever it is that they've been chasing and suddenly they're not thirsty anymore. But people who are like me and I think like you as well are actually running and because we're running continuously, even after we've had our water, we're still running. So we're gonna get thirsty again. And we're running and we're running and we're running and we don't stop ever. Um, and it doesn't matter like, yeah, you have water here and there, but you're running again. If you've ever tried to run a marathon, <laughs> I mean, a few kilometers in and another kilometer, you need, you need those water breaks, right? So I think it's like a difference between like, people who know that they have a course that they want to, you know, chase and they get thirsty in pursuit of that and they're satisfied. Or there's people that are always hungry. And I think that when you live your life like that, I think so many opportunities come your way because you're constantly putting yourself in a position where something is going to work out. Yeah. <laughs> something is going to happen. If you work hard every single day at something, something's going to happen. There's no question. Yeah. My friend, um, he, let, let's say something like this, as simple as this. I played basketball a few years ago in high school and uh, I haven't played basketball in a while, um, but there's like intramurals, let's say, that happen at the university. Yeah. And so, you know, he, we've started picking up the basketball again. He's gotten me back into shooting. He wants me to be on the intramural team. And in that, I, in that, you know, I'm a little rusty. But then I told him, I was like, give me six months. And I think that's really what it takes. Like anytime there's a skill or something that I don't know how to do, I always tell that person, like, give me six months. Yeah. Like, I just need six months and I'll come back and I'll be better or I'll have achieved this. I mean, it doesn't really take a lot other than your determination to like get through or to learn a new skill or to do something new. Yeah. And why not? Like, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, yeah. So, thank you for that. And, uh, you know, but what's important for me is to write the book against all odds for all the reasons that I told you earlier, not for hurrah, hurrah, John, but rather precisely what you're talking about falling down, trying over again, uh, uh, and, and never giving up and staying the course and believing that I have this boundless belief that if you keep doing the right things, everything will fall into place. And, uh, and then the other one, obviously ADHD uh, was a good one. The other part that I feel deeply about it is that uh, from my experience and, and uh, people in general that I know, there are so many people that are not happy with what they are doing and they wish mm -hmm. they would have made other choices, but unfortunately now they uh, have commitments, so they're stuck in this thing that they don't like and so, and it will affect their whole life. So one, one book that I'm working on right now that will come out next July is uh, uh, find your passion and live the dream. You know, because if somebody asks me that, uh, you know, what am I doing? How am I working so hard and do all the things that you were talking about? Uh, never stop running, uh, you know, even not at nearly 82. It's because I'm living the dream. It simply doesn't get any better. It's not about money. It's about, uh, I've had people saying to me being negative, uh, I, I avoid negative. That's why for me, as it says on this sign here, what I had in my pocket was $25.47. But what is even more important is attitude, passion, work ethic, but follows success. And, and success more than anything to me means not a lot of money. It's nothing to do with money. It's saying that I, I think I'm a good person and I work hard and, and uh, I've been helpful to others. And, uh, you know, and, and on the overall, if I look back and say, hmm, yeah, it was good life, you know, and, and I'm going to do more of it, you know, mm -hmm. so, uh, and, and uh, you know, and, and that to me is what is important. The other one that's important to me is respect. 
you know, so that I've always said, and we employ, you see around 400 people or so, but I always say to uh, my management team and, and other supervisors that, you know, that as long as I own the company, the culture will be, we will respect everyone. I don't care if they get there two minutes ago or five minutes ago, or they have been there for 40 years, we will respect them. We can demand respect in return, you know, that's, that's fair, you know, so, but I do not care about uh, who they are, where they came from, choices that they make in their lives and religion or, or whatever. If they, uh, whoever they are, we will respect them as equals and that to me has always been very important. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so, and that's the policy that we have in my company and uh, every so often when things go a little bit sideways, I right away say, no, that's mm -hmm. not what will happen, you know, so, and I believe that part is important, at least to me. Yeah, respect is crucial because it just, you can't always, like, it supersedes even kindness, right, because kindness is still something you can give. Right, we can choose to withhold or choose to give a measure of kindness. Right, yeah. I, I might, you know, give you ten bucks, but I might give my bestie a hundred. Yeah, out of kindness, you know. Right. But respect is just like that one thing that's immeasurable. So exactly, I mean, it's it's very valuable. But you mentioned something really important, like speaking about your new book and just like finding what you love. I think the most crucial thing is like being a go-getter and doing everything you want to do means you live without regret. It means that like at any chance you had any opportunity, even if it was a no, like going back to that point about failing, even if it was a no, you don't have that what if now. Yeah. You already know like a hundred percent in your heart, you already like gave 110 into something and it didn't work out. Yeah. And so now you get to live your life knowing that, you know, it didn't work out, it's fine, no what ifs, no regret. But then if you get to a certain point where, not to say that you can't start something new at 40 or 50, but that's 40 or 50 years that you had, right? So it's like living, like even as a young person now, just like having that mindset of like, I'm gonna take everything. Every opportunity that comes my way is either a door that's gonna to open to something else or it's a door that's gonna close and something else will open. Yeah, and, and so true. And at the same time, uh, Nadia, is that, uh, you know, the other thing, and I encountered a, a young fellow that was here actually for, <laughs> he's my brother's, unfortunately passed away, his grandson was here for a number of weeks, uh, Teespring, and uh, a young fellow, ambitious, and uh, he wanted to spend, uh, you know, a, a month or so with me and to see what I was doing and following me very, very closely. and. Uh, uh, you know, I had him involved in all the meetings and, and so he, he has ambitions, uh, he's going to university studying business in particular and uh, he had been very active in interviewing CEOs. Now take some effort, you know, and, and I, I want to remove the myth that if you call a CEO and said, well, I'm a young person and I'm, I have ambitions to maybe at some point be a CEO of a company, can I talk to you? He talked to 150 of them in Holland. And, and I thought that was interesting as that, but I see a lot of times with younger people is saying as they're exploring, where, what career's choice should I make? And may it be in business, may it be in physician, may it be whatever choices they make. I want to talk to people that I have respect and that I believe can help me. So is there a possibility to sit down with you for half an hour, an hour or so that I can talk about things that I'm hoping to do and am I going in the right direction? And where a lot of people make a mistake, they think they, nobody wants to talk to them and it's, and it's just to the contrary because most people are like that, like myself. I always encourage people to do that because that's what I did when I was younger is I had the courage to, uh, always watch and listen to people that had been successful, successful at least in the interpretation mm -hmm. of, in my case, business in, in particular, uh, you know, and find out what made them click, what made them mm -hmm. successful, how did they do what they did. Mm -hmm. and, and the same in, in another sense applies to life in the general sense, uh, you know, the, uh, 
uh, a lot of times we are, uh, you know, the, to a certain extent, people do not necessarily like to see success. There are people that are negative about it, as you already indicated. And, and uh, what I usually say is a, a couple of things that, uh, you know, that success uh, or being successful, uh, you know, is that they say it must be luck. I always say the harder you work, the luckier you get. That's how it works. You know, so and the other part that I say that if somebody uh, is, is, you know, is not or criticizes, then I say credibility, you know, is indefensible because your enemies, you can't convince and your friends already know. So I'm not overly interested in talking about what I believe to be credible and what works for me. And, uh, you know, so, but the book finding your passion and living the dream would touch on a number of things in terms of like that as to how can I become more knowledgeable about how, what is the process that would be helpful to me as a young person mm. or, or medium age that, uh, you know, that I'm searching for what should my career be or where would I be good in certain things and, and what does it mean as we go further downstream in terms of saying that, you know, what is important to me, not me, but I say in a general way, is that I want to get a job that uh, allows me a good balance between family and, and work. Starting a company from the ground up is, is uh, being an entrepreneur is, is uh, extremely demanding or can be demanding. And, uh, you know, because a lot of people think that, uh, if you build a company from the ground up as I did, is what you do most of the times, you count your money and then you plan holidays. Well, it's not quite like that, you know, so, and, and then, but on the other hand, you know, to, to say, but I would love to be is this. And then the younger you are, the more you can move in that direction in the general sense in saying, that's a good foundation. And where do I go from here on the step by step basis going mm. forward. And, uh, you know, and, uh, but I always believe that it's important to have respect first and foremost. Mm. Well, you touched on something else too, which is mm. just like that aspect of mentorship. Really, yeah. it's like having strong mentors. And I think I've been really fortunate to have that growing up. Correct. My dad, um, just like seeing other uh, strong, women I think being around like let's say Catherine yeah. Catherine Hansen she's been just somebody that you can look up to and that you are observing you're noticing yeah. you're seeing how somebody else is success um, amounted for them and then learning from them like that's the biggest way to truly learn and, and gain like a valuable like skill set is just from others and I think um, a lot of young people, I think the biggest thing is like two, two things. Like, first of all, having that mentorship from somebody older, somebody who's done it, somebody who's got yeah. it. But then it's also like your circle. Yeah. Right. So I think it's like, it's like who is really in that tight circle that's there every day. Are they cheering you on? Are they supporting no you? No question they, about that. Are they actually on your side? Because yeah. I know in my experience, I've had a lot of people come and go out of my life and the ones that go are the ones that aren't really there for no. any true purpose right no. and you look back and you think of things over and you're like yeah they thank god they're gone yeah <laughs> right because like even within your circle there's sharks right yeah. and you don't want to swim among them yeah. so you have to be really conscious of of that and and people aren't always in your life for um a lifetime they're there for a lesson and yeah. you need to be careful of that i've had to learn yeah. that a lot of times we all did uh, yeah. nadia because uh, and and what we want to make sure is that we don't become i'm not saying that you would be but if you get hurt a number of times uh, then uh, you may become uh, uh, negative about yeah. people and and i don't want to do that I'm a realist and I know that will happen and that, but mm -hmm. the circle around my life as it is around yours, 
are people that care about me and love me and be there even when things get tough and difficult and uh, and there are not many of them a lot of times and then there's another circle of people that uh, care about me and uh, and us in uh, the sense that uh, you know we uh, respect each other and uh, uh, you know that sort of thing. Now the other thing that I want to talk about with you as well is you have been uh, proactive in, in discrimination issues and you were involved in uh, a video that you did. Tell me a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Is it the series with the school district? Yeah. Or is the bar? Yeah, so that was an, an initiative. I think it came out of... Uh, I was graduated at that point. <laughs> <Just thinking laughs> I feel old though. Um, yeah, that was, that was my first year of uni. I think that was like after... Like really after, um, I think Black Lives Matter, yeah, you yeah. know, the whole movement. And yeah, yeah. that really did spark a lot of conversation oh, where yeah, we no were question. like, you know, yeah. or something. I think within the school district, unfortunately, there is a lot of racism. Yeah. And it's, it's from very young, it's a young culture and it's a very challenging thing to address. And yeah. I think that we really want to do something proactive. So we were doing a video series in which we, the DSAC group ended up um, kind of dividing it up into themes and whatnot. Yeah. I think the most important thing though is from that comes that listening part, right? Is, yeah. you know, to just really listen and to acknowledge that like there's a real problem in our school district. There's a real problem when, you know, you look at some of the, the graduation rates or um, the, the indigenous education system right yeah. now within Prince George or the supports that are there for like indigenous students. And we can see, I mean, that like things aren't really getting better. And that's a problem, right? You know, these are fundamental issues or um, that do stem from systemic racism that happens here in Prince George. And these yeah. are like, concerning issues yeah. to say the least that affect yeah. students yeah. that should feel safe enough to be in a learning environment. Yeah. Um, indigenous or black uh, individuals or people of color who are going to school thinking like, oh, it's probably normal. It's not probably normal to go down a hallway and be called an effing terrorist. Like that's yeah. not supposed to happen, no. right? It's like these little things. Um, and the series was powerful because it was like student voice led, right? So it wasn't like, um, there wasn't a lot of like adult voice at all. It was all like student voices. So you were hearing firsthand. Um, and I think I really spoke to my own experience just being n not, um, how do I say this? I think I struggled a lot when I was growing up in high school being like one of the only visibly Muslim girls because I chose to wear my hijab. And at one point, um, I think it just was like, you kind of shrink, right? Eventually things do get to you and you're young and it gets a lot. Uh, and I ended up not wearing my hijab for a few years. And within that scope, it was a really, really weird dimension because before when I wore my hijab, it was like, you're this like, brown girl and there's a lot of things that come with that right you're cultured and you're this and you're that and then as soon as I took it off because of my lighter complexion suddenly it's just like you lose all of that and you become like white so to say it's like a very it was very very confusing for me when I was growing up because it was like with the hijab Nadia was like all this like she was brown and then or like people acknowledged more my arab or my syrian heritage i remember like people ask me all the time well where are you from where are you from when i didn't wear my hijab for like two years i don't even remember like one time somebody asking me where are you from because i have like lighter complexion skin so it's like you can't associate anything else you know like as soon as you see somebody with a hijab yeah i can't deny that there's a lot of stereotypes out there that do negate that yes, you're probably not, you know, like Canadian, you know? Yeah. So it's like, it was so weird. And it's, life is so much different. I mean, without wearing my hijab, just the yeah, way yeah. the world is. On the, I guess you could say on the other side, the way things happen and people treat you, it's, 
it is very different. It's so different. And I think in my decision to wear my hijab again after high school, it was kind of just like, I'm not going to let anybody tell me who I am. No. Right. And you reach a point where like you look back and you're like, nah, I'm going to be who I am. And that's enough because it's enough for me. But when I wore my hijab again, I think like, not that I don't still experience a lot of the things I experienced when I was younger, but I think it's like your like approach to them. And like, I think that now that I've grown up and I've been able to do all the things I want to do, despite the fact that I'm a girl, despite the fact that I'm a Muslim woman, like in a town where there's really not a lot of Muslims. Um, I think I've like proven to myself that I'm like, I am who I am and this is who I am. This is how it's going to be. But yeah, I mean, sometimes it is tough when you talk to people and they say little things like, um, oh, I didn't know, you, like, oh, your English is so well, or your English is, like, amazing. And I'm just like, oh, you expected me to not be able to speak English. <laughs> but that's, a, you know, and, and the reality, and you talk about being a realist, is that you know that these things are coming your way. Yeah. You know that people are already they're going to have a perception and that's what makes it tougher is that whenever you like walk into a room not only are you walking like in a world where we know it's like a, a male's world as we say it's a man's world so anytime that i feel like you're walking into a room or you're walking into a space not only do people already have some kind of like box because i'm a girl but there's another layer to that when you walk into a room and you're like a Muslim woman, right? People already have this like list of like A, B, C, D, E of like who you are, right? And a lot of times it's like, I'm not really any of those things, yeah. you know? And um, it is challenging sometimes because yeah. you have to take up, you have to make more space for yourself. Less now when you're at university, you're in 19 and, mm -hmm. and moving into those uh, still you feel uh, is it getting better you think or lesser I think really what changes is again that energy like when high school when you're younger you're forced in a way yeah to be around this group of people these yeah. people every day because nine, they don't know nine to three better, right but as soon as you're like outside of that and you're in university and stuff, it's like, I'm just here for my classes and then I'm out. And I'm cultivating a whole life outside of, I'm choosing all the energy that I'm surrounding myself with. And um, yeah, there's still people who are out there and are, and are, you know, Islamophobic. And, you know, there was a few recent, there was in a recent, uh, um, event last year when the Afzal family got run over uh, in Ontario and we did, had a vigil and stuff and I just remember like posting stuff about it like within my Facebook and then he just you know there's a few comments here and there that you're just like yeah, okay <laughs> you know just some negativity like being like Islamophobia doesn't really exist oh like some stuff. sometimes is people being naive and uh, you know I remember when I first came to uh, Canada I could speak the language and uh, you know and and uh, was told many many times that uh, you, you know, all the things that you were and why don't you go you this that and the other thing back to your own country or whatever mm -hmm. you know so uh, but I feel sorry for them in a way the the, the underlying part is respect in my understanding and uh, you know that that's always the way I look at it and I don't look at you any different as I would to anybody else mm -hmm. you know that uh, uh, you you are uh, bright and 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 uh, I feel privileged to have you as my guest and and not for the reasons that uh, you know your religion uh, or that you are a Muslim background, uh, that, that to me is all things that uh, are interesting, but I respect, you know, so, and I would hope 
that, uh, you know, if I look at Canada in particular, we, we collectively, and I'm sure you agree with me, so lucky to live in Canada, mm -hmm. BC in particular, and, and Northern BC, is that, uh, you know, it, it is a mosaic of uh, all different people from around the world uh, that have met different skin tones maybe, uh, uh, and, and, and maybe have a bit of a different background, but we are all people that respect and have passion for all the people that we care and love and uh, you know so we're all the same you know and and at, at what I always kind of find that it is important for me to whatever the opportunity presents itself to not only talk about it but show it and all the things that I do you know the uh, that's important to me and uh, you know s same as the uh, indigenous community and uh, we work closely with them. Uh, we employ as many people as we can from the indigenous community. A lot of them are my friends. We have a mutual friend, the drummer, uh, Wes Mitchell, and uh, uh, you know who was my guest yesterday, <laughs> actually. And he's a he's a beautiful individual, and uh, you know so uh, I respect. I have a deep respect for you and what you do, and. Uh, I, I want you to stay in touch with us and uh, it has helped hopefully our guests to understand a little bit more about you as a, a young lady that is building a career uh, you know and and journalism and is still kind of feeling her way as to exactly where she wants to go and uh, uh, it was a pleasure to have you as my guest. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks Anini. Yeah. <laughs>